The Mercedes W14 is another car that when you look at it at a first glance, it doesn't look that different to last year. But once you look closer, you'll see that it's absolutely jam-packed with innovative and aggressive aerodynamic detailing. In this video, we're going to go from the front to the back of the car, looking at all these details, what they do, and how they work. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19, and 20 Formula 1 seasons. I now work as an aerodynamics consultant, designing race car aerodynamics packages for cars in all different classes all around the world. And this video comes with my standard disclaimer if you can't fully predict aerodynamic flows on something as complex as an F1 car by eye, but we're going to give it a good crack. Anyway, let's start the analysis. Starting at the front wing, we have to look at the front wing outboard because what they've done here is really trick just out in this particular region here. They've actually largely disconnected their elements here from the front wing end plate and then just had little stays in there. And let's go and have a look at that detail. Now what I've got here is I've got some shots from various angles of this new detail and I've also got a shot of their wing from last year and over here I have some relevant rules. So the first question you're probably asking me is how is this legal? Well Mercedes last year ran this setup here where they have a very far forward sweep on their elements and that allows them to cut out a very large portion of the rear wing tip over here. Now the legality box in which the tip operates basically uh, is this area here where they basically have this box that they can put uh, a certain tip geometry in there. And for this year, they came up with a whole bunch of rules with a convoluted system of planes to basically mean that you couldn't have this Mercedes solution. There had to be a certain degree of spacing between the planes. This exact solution wouldn't be possible. However, something that slipped through that no one really noticed is that they also changed another part in the rules. This particular part in the rules that they changed, they struck out a component that said that the sole purpose of the surfaces within that tip legality volume is to create a smooth transition with no discontinuities between the front wing profiles and the front wing end plate body. So the front wing end plate body being up here, front wing profiles being the bits along here. So last year, it was required by rules that you must have a smooth transition between these two with no discontinuities. That has been removed. And so what they've been able to do is use that to allow them to have this particular discontinuity here. Now, there is another component to this, which is that the front wing tip in this region must be a, a closed single volume, no apertures, uh, and there are some specific radius rules. So you couldn't just completely disconnect this from there. You've got to have some form of connection. Now the radius rules got opened up a tiny little bit this year, not a huge amount, but basically at certain points with respect to the junction, you can disobey some of the radius rules. And so we can have tight radii that allow us to have these little stays that are going across. So we can have some very tight fillet radii on the stays. There's a requirement on each element that is of a minimum length. The element must be a minimum length. But there is no requirement that the minimum length is carried over the entire width of the element. So if you imagine if we sliced with a Z plane, so basically we cut more or less through here, the element when viewed from above would look something like you'd have an airfoil here and then it would come out to the stay and then it would come back. Although over here it would obviously connect to the actual end plate body. And you can see that that particular element overall, the length is specifically measured from the front to the rear, that element would be above the minimum length. So they can cut it down there. It's perfectly within the rules. And of course these tips go high enough up here that they overlap with the end plate. So all in all, this system looks to me from my reading of the rules to be perfectly legal. And it's just another really interesting and innovative look that Mercedes has taken in this front wing tip area. Now, what are they trying to do aerodynamically with it? Well, obviously as they open this up, they get more porosity in this region. You can allow air to basically flow through the gap through there um, and it'll basically flow around there. And because you've got some degree of a free tip, you'll get some degree of vorticity spinning up along the edge. So that vorticity will be formed by this corner already, but having a more open end plate here will power up that vorticity. And it will also enable you to have more outwash through that rearwards portion. Because if you imagine we've cut out this whole section here on the old design, on the new design, we haven't cut it out uh, in this particular view, but we have cut it out from here. And all the elements are quite backed off. So we are going to allow more mass flow through that region. And we're gonna largely achieve the intent of last year's geometry. So basically more outwash through the cutout and a stronger vorticity along the corner. 
Now, one other little detail that you may have missed in this region is they didn't just stop at disconnecting the elements from the end plate. They went one step further and they actually put in a tiny downwashing vein in this particular region. It's pretty hard to spot because it's very small and the images aren't great, but you can see there's just this tiny little downwashing vein here. And I assume that they're going to be using the rules uh, around the junctions and everything in the same sort of sense from a legality perspective to make this happen. Uh, and what this downwashing vein should do is that it should uh, spin a vortex off it that's going this way, which should be the same way as the vortex that's coming around the corner. So we've got some co-rotating vorticity here, which basically will increase the overall strength of the vortex system in this region. And because we've added a little bit of downwash here, we should get a little bit more pressure underneath, which should again increase the, the mass flow through the system outwards and it should also increase the strength of the system because if we increase the pressure here, we should get stronger uh, vortices rolling up around the outside. But because we've got more pressure on the top, we should have a larger delta P around the shedding edge to drive more circulation. Now, as to the main front wing, uh, it's fairly vanilla through the center. I don't have too much to say. What I will say is that it's clearly a little bit more uh, center line loaded this time around. It's a little bit more cranked than last year's one, which generally speaking dropped down more in the center. And this is a shot from below of last year's one where you can see how nicely those profiles merge into the undernose region, which would have been very nice and clean. So I can't quite tell from the shots available, but maybe they've they've pulled up the nose to achieve this effect, or maybe it's actually an optical illusion and the center line is where it was. and They've actually backed off the mid portion. Both are available options. You'll note also the flap is very, very smooth on this particular car that we've seen. Given that Mercedes experimented a lot with notches and various other details in their flap over the course of the season last year uh, to sort of play around with how they're shedding vorticity, I would hazard a guess that there's going to be some different flaps that are going to make an appearance at some point. Looking further forwards to the mid floor of this car, we have a very interesting and cranked barge board and floor strake layout. You'll see that the top edge along this barge board is really hitting it. It's going very hard out. And we've actually got a supporting vein further inboards uh, on the more inboards floor turning veins that is also cranked out to match. Now, like I've discussed on a few other cars, we'll be getting some strong vorticity out here. Uh, and in this particular case, we'll be getting it shed across two edges. This vorticity should drive outwash along the floor and potentially outwash of the, uh, the lower wake further rearwards. But the key thing with the Mercedes setup is that it's just so damn cranked. I think this might be the most cranked setup on the grid. And obviously with that cranking comes a lot of vortex strength, but also a lot of loss. And I think that the reason why they've split it across these two edges is so that they can basically use the inboard vein to support the outboard vein. So that basically this vein here will help support the, the turning of this vein. And that should back off the vorticity a little bit on the outboard portion, which will make it that little bit cleaner. But we're not gonna compromise on overall strength because we've obviously got the vorticity spread on both. So we've got vortex strength coming from both of these elements. You can also see how we've got this sort of secondary scallop here where we've got the top goes out and then the bottom goes out. I really think that they must be using the legality box for the absolute maximum here to maximize outwash. And it makes sense when you think about the Mercedes philosophy because this is a car that the side pod on it is much smaller than all its competition. It doesn't use that same sort of bluff stagnation based side pod that we've seen across the grid, even if that is starting to, to be less of a feature this year. It's a very different side pod. And if they're not using the side pod front as much to control the tire wake, then they need to lean heavier on these devices down low to help push that tire wake outboard. Now, talking about those side pods themselves, this year Mercedes has got largely the same philosophy in this region as what they had last year. The main difference is that the top is a lot wider than last year, so we come out more at the top, uh, and the bottom is a lot narrower. So instead of having that wide bottom, we, we come in and we're more or less vertical uh, and then we come in at the bottom there. And we have a bit less of that sort of melted candle look. And legality wise, this should be pretty much the same as last year. If you look at my video on last year's Mercedes side pods, as long as our leading edge of our side pod is below our side pod wing up top, and it's also rearwards of the side pod wing up top, you should be fine for legality. Because the key rule is you're only allowed two sections in this area. So you'd have one section for the wing, one section for the side pod, which comes down and then you would close off the side pod with essentially the floor. So nothing too much has really changed in that particular area. It's just a slightly different shape. In terms of function, much like last year, we've got this big downwashing side pod wing up the top, which is going to introduce a large amount of pressure under there because we've got the pressure on the underside of the wing. That pressure is going to help with the wake management in a similar way to how the stagnation-based side pods work. But then we'll also have 
a fairly large and powerful vortex structure being shut off here, which is going to have a bulk rotation that way, which should help rotate the wake out a little bit, as well as increasing outwash along the floor edge down low. In general, you can see that Mercedes has definitely relied more on devices like this than they are on large bluff objects, which generally speaking from a pure aerodynamic standpoint is quite useful because things like wings and stuff like that, they're far more tunable than just bluff edges. So it's certainly a lot nicer to play with something that's largely based on the stagnation pressure of a wing plus a vortex based flow. So at least from a theoretical standpoint, this still makes a lot of sense. Looking further back on the side pod, it has actually changed a bit further rearwards compared to last year with a whole bunch more volume being added through this particular portion here. Now, if we do a little bit of a comparison year on year, you'll see that what I've got here is I've got W12 up the top and I've got W13 in the middle and W14 up the bottom. Now the contrast isn't great on the W12 image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw you out that bodywork line just there. And you can see that it's not dissimilar to what was on the W13. They went for that same type philosophy. Whereas on the W14, we're much wider out in this particular region, which is a lot more in line with what Ferrari and the like are doing. So why would we want to do this? Well, firstly, I just want to talk through what a lot of commentary has been based around in the last year and why I think that's not the case and what I think is actually being done here. A lot of people were saying that Mercedes porpoising problems are due to the fact they've got so much floor exposed at the rear. In terms of a pure aerodynamics argument, that doesn't make a huge amount of sense because if we assume that the argument is that more exposed floor at the rear is more load on the floor, well, for a start, pressure above the floor, not that high compared to the very large amounts of suction underneath the floor. You couldn't have more than CP1 above the floor, but you might be down to CP negative six below the floor. So that doesn't really make sense because the thing is like, even if there was an effect with more pressure on top of the floor, that wouldn't make your porpoising necessarily worse because a lot of the porpoising effect is gonna come from what's going on underneath the floor. The only argument that could be made for that is that if the extra load on the floor was causing more floor deflection. And this leads me into the second point that a lot of people have talked about how Mercedes with all their exposed floor area must be less stiff on the floor. And that could be a reason why their porpoising is worse. That doesn't particularly stack for me either. Because if you have a look, FIA allowed them to have this stay go all the way out to the edge of the floor. Now that stay is going a long way out on the floor and it's anchoring right in the region where you would expect the floor flex to be the biggest issue for any sort of porpoising based phenomena. So people have kind of said that because Mercedes doesn't have the side pods out the full width, they can't have stays that are going to the floor uh, that can help support the floor and stop the flex. So what I did was I went a little bit nuts and I grabbed photos of pretty much every single team on the grid to have a look at what their stay layout actually was underneath their radiators. And if you have a look, teams like Ferrari, for example, do have a stay at the rear of the radiator. So they've got it underneath their bodywork. You can see it's just sitting around here. That's the stay inside their bodywork. And that's quite far forwards when you actually have a look at where it is. Uh, and then they've got that rearward stay from the FIA there. Red Bull has a far more comprehensive stay layout where they've ended up with stays going alongside the radiator subframe. We've got stays there, stays there, stays all over the place. So Red Bull does have quite a lot of stays. But when you actually have a look across the rest of the grid, there's a huge number of cars on the grid that didn't have big porpoising issues, did have large side pods, and didn't have stays that were connecting to the floor within those side pods. So I don't at all buy that the side pod area and covering the floor is what would have made a difference to porpoising. And if I had to guess what the Mercedes porpoising woes really caused by, I'd have to guess that it's probably that they were just putting all their area development at an area at really low ride height where they probably found a lot of performance and they just maybe weren't able to achieve the ride heights they wanted to in real life without suffering horrible porpoising issues. So if it's not porpoising, then why is Mercedes fattening out their side pod here? Well, my theory is that it would be for purely aerodynamic reasons, because if you imagine that we have a wake off the front tire and we push it out with all our device at the front, we push it out here. Like I've discussed on some of my other videos, that particular wake will eventually work its way backwards and it will get drawn in if you draw the bodywork in. So for example, if we have the wake out here and we pull in the bodywork in this region, we've reduced the amount of volume that's holding the wake out. So this will pull the wake trajectory in a little bit. Now obviously there's a lot more complexity going on than what I've just described, but that should be roughly true. So by holding this out for longer along here, we should keep the wake out for longer and then maybe we put it in a more favorable position further rearwards. And this is a philosophy that we've seen on a number of teams cars, notably the Ferrari, where they have that really big bit that goes out for a while and then pulls in at the back. So I don't think this is super surprising to see. 
I don't think that it really changes the philosophy on the car. It's just a slight design tweak. The other thing is that obviously by puffing out this side pod region, it's gonna naturally make the cooling flows a little bit easier to manage inside the bodywork. The bodywork up high is following a similar intent to what we've seen on a few other cars this year, where we've got this big sort of high bulky section with then a downwashing section right onto the rear wing there. Um, this is something we've seen on a few cars and I've explained already, so I'm not gonna go through it again. But the other thing that I would take note of is the fact that they have slightly reduced their overall louver amount from last year. They did have a lot more louvers last year. They've cut that down a little bit, particularly up high. And their rear cooling exit is a bit wider than last year as well. So it looks like they're doing more rear cooling than they are cooling through the louvers. The final bit of this car that's really interesting is a part that I've confirmed uh, exists on the real thing. It's not just in the renders and that's the floor edge wing. And this I think is a really aggressive piece on the car. What we have is we have a hugely tall and aggressive ramp along the side here. So you can see that it ramps up really high. So this is this bit here is the same bit that I've highlighted in red there, which is also this portion here. And in terms of what they're doing here, well, with that large bit uh, of upwash there, they've obviously got a system up here where with their two strong outwashing vortices there, as well as their big vortex off the, the side pod wing there, they're going to end up with a decent chunk of outwash going through there, and they're gonna harness that outwash and really convert it into upwash and uh, local suction in this area. And obviously any suction and extraction that they produce here is something that's gonna to propagate to the forward floor. Because if we can get more air pulled out via here by powering up this curl, we will basically drop the pressure in this whole floor region. Uh, and then you can manipulate that in different ways with the floor strakes to allow you to get better performance in the floor system. Now, just behind this curl, you'll note that they've got quite a severe cut in here and then it goes back straight. And they're, they're sacrificing a lot of plant form to achieve this particular cut, which tells me that if they gave up this much plant form for it, they must be getting some pretty sizable benefits in terms of vortex management, whether that's positioning or whether that's strength or whether that's health going into the underfloor here. Now, obviously we've got a slot uh, along this whole floor edge wing. Now for the forwards portion, I would imagine that, that allows them to bleed a bit of mass flow through and clean up that big old curl. And for the rearwards portion, it would allow them to distribute that vorticity over two edges. So basically you would have a vortex on the outboard edge rolling up and you'd also have a vortex on the inboard edge rolling up. And those vortices will find their way into the diffuser because you've got a large amount of expansion going this way. So they are gonna get pulled in that way. And this is an area we've seen teams develop quite heavily. This is probably Mercedes development response to maybe slightly higher ride heights, as well as the new floor edge rules where they've lifted up that floor edge ever so slightly. But I think this is a, a really aggressive approach here and it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But overall, I think this car's got some really interesting features on it and I'm definitely keen to see how it performs at race one. Well, that's all for this analysis video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me and hopefully I'll see you next time.